Well, hey, man, appreciate that, brother. Appreciate that great presentation. We pull this thing down. He said, do you want to hand hit a mic? I said, no, I'm liable to throw it at somebody. And because uh, I move around quite a bit when I preach. But uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. I've enjoyed the meeting on last night and have enjoyed it so far this morning and looking forward to tonight. Amen. And uh, I appreciate Brother Crane and his great church. And uh, I consider him to be my friend. And uh, I appreciate how he takes good, uh, good care of my grandpa when he's down here and he speaks so highly of this church and this pastor, and I appreciate that. I am a new pastor. I've been pastoring two months. I pastored the Woodlawn Baptist Church in High Point, North Carolina, and uh, I thought I was crazy to leave where I was at. I was on a good staff with a good pastor and a good home church, but God has a way of moving you around sometimes, and uh, God had converted my heart about six months before that he wanted me to pastor a church, and I wasn't sure where, and I said, well, I'll go wherever you want me to go, and he just took me 30 minutes up the road over to High Point to a church who was... Uh, really on the verge of closing his doors, shutting down, and uh, existed no more. A church with a preacher of great lineage and great heritage. Men like Dr. Green, Harold Seitler, uh, J. Harold Smith had stood in the same pulpit and preached and proclaimed the Word of God and souls were saved. And they had uh, had such a shift in leadership that they tried to go contemporary. And I'll go ahead and tell you this some more, and I'm against all that mess. And uh, I believe old-time religion still works, even in 2015. I think the Bible still works. Don't need to modify it or change it. We just need to preach exactly what God said in His book. Amen. I'm talking to men that know that. Now I'm preaching to the choir. Amen. And uh, so what happened was, believe it or not, the young folk left. The old folks stayed. And uh, they began to pray that God would send a preacher. I drove by the property, never been there before. God laid on my heart, told me that's where I was going to pastor. And I, I told my wife, she told me I was crazy. And a few months, a few weeks later, after we'd seen it, some men came to me and wanted to know if I'd be interested in candidate. And I said, sure, I will. And uh, we went, and God has begun to do a great work and revitalize a great work there in High Point, North Carolina. And with that being said, this was mentioned last night. And I'm sorry, right, preacher, I'll put this paper out down here down front. Uh, as mentioned last night, my grandpa mentioned uh, in years gone by, Spruce Street Baptist Church had a camp meeting that was known around the nation. And uh, after he left Spruce Street, there's really not been a meeting in our part of North Carolina that uh, I, I hate to say it could really do some things and help people along the way. We've got good meetings, don't get me wrong. But I, I think you need something, just like what you've got here, to revitalize the community and recharge preachers and recharge churches to send them back out on the field. Because if we're not careful, we get that foxhole mentality like Elijah, I'm the only one left. And uh, I'm the only one doing right. I'm the only one doing what I'm supposed to be doing. But what happens when we get in meetings like this or like those, we find out we're not the only one. Amen. And uh, we get in kindred fellowship and kindred spirit with one another and encourage one another. I like preaching. Amen. I like somebody to preach to me. I preach all the time now and I enjoy when I sit down and somebody preaches to me. Amen. And so uh, we are going to restart, try to restart that great camp meeting next year in May, the week before Memorial day. That'll be the 22nd through the 26th. It'll be a Sunday through a Thursday. And we're going to try to go back and uh, just pull back some old-time heritage, some old-time way of worshiping the Lord. Can I say this morning that it's alright to say amen and raise your hand? Well, I've been retraining those people where I'm at. They've not said amen, I think, in a thousand years. And I scared them to death the first Sunday I was there. I run off the pulpit shouting and running around waving my hand, waving my hanky. And I thought they was all going to fall out the floor. And they came to me later and said, it's been years since we've seen anybody preach like that. I said, well, I only got one gear and it's wide open. Amen. And uh, that's why I said last night, I told my doctor, my, oral, uh, my head and neck oncologist, when he done surgery in my mouth, I said, whatever you do, don't take my preaching gear out because I only got one. If you mess it up, I said, I'll have to go sell cars or something for a living. And uh, amen. Amen. You can laugh. It'll be all right. Take your Bible. Turn with me this morning to 1 Kings chapter number 18. 1 Kings chapter number 18. I believe the Old Testament is still relevant for New Testament Christians. Say amen. I believe we can still take a lot out of the Old Testament. I know a lot of preachers won't preach out of it, but I love to preach out of the Old Testament portion of the Bible. And I believe there's a lot of application for you and I today. 1 Kings chapter 18. If you get a moment this morning and you're interested, if you'll take put your name, address, phone number, and email on this piece of paper, and we'll send you some information in the week to come about what's going to go on in High Point, North Carolina. I hope we stir High Point upside down for the glory of God. I hope they'll say that these are they that have turned the world upside down. And uh, we want, I want to do something for High Point in our community. 
And uh, I want to ask you this before, uh, before we read this morning. You pray for our church. I'm away from home today, and uh, they're going to go out in the community tonight and invite people to our first open house there at Woodlawn Baptist Church. And I really want to see the Lord do something there this weekend. And I've been praying that God would go before those men tonight and make the way straight, prepare the hearts of people. So you help me pray for that today, that God would do a great work tonight. Help those men uh, as they go out and try to win and witness to people and invite them to church on Sunday. Amen. I think one preacher told me this. He said, if you'll keep the main thing the main thing, he said, you'll do right. And he said, the main thing so win. And amen. And uh, I'm in an area where nobody so wins. Nobody knocks on doors. Nobody goes out in the community. They figure they do it on television. They'll put the billboard up. But can I say this morning before I preach that knocking on doors still works. Going out and knocking on the door and sharing with someone face to face the old King James Bible, putting their face, pointing to them, the Word of God still changes lives and still works in 2015. If it didn't work, I'd just close my Bible and go find something else to do. But I'm here this morning and you're here this morning because somebody took the Bible and showed us how to be saved through the Word of God. And like this young man said, his desire is that he can take the Bible in his language and show his people how they can receive Christ. Have an old black back King James Bible. Amen. First Kings chapter number 18. Let's stand together. Begin reading in verse number 20. Stand with me, please, that we reverence the reading of the Word of God and we remain standing for prayer time. 1 Kings chapter number 18. I will read verses 20 and verses 38 for context of time, but I'll preach from 20 to 38. But the Bible said in verse number 20, So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. Verse 21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. Verse number 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. I'm going to preach between these verses this morning on this thought. Then the fire fell. Then the fire fell. What we desperately need among our nation and among churches today is a fresh falling of the fire of God. I dare say in churches that I have preached in in my short time of ministry that the fire has extinguished itself and gone out and we're not in a place to receive the fire to fall from heaven. But God help us this morning to allow God to put us in the appropriate place that the fire of heaven may fall, consume the altar upon the sacrifice and reignite the fire of service in the house of God. My desire this morning and I hope yours is is to be in the place that I can receive the power of heaven to fall upon my life and be an example and a witness to a lost and dying world that the God that had consumed me as a 13-year-old boy would be the God that would consume them in these last days. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the time. You have allowed us to gather together. I pray you take the preaching of the Word of God and I pray you use it to challenge our heart this morning. Our greatest desire is that we would leave different than we came in this morning. May the Bible, your precious Word, be applied to the depths of our soul. May it change us and further encourage us to go one step farther for the glory of God. Lord, I pray you touch my clay lips this morning. I pray you touch my body. Give me unction of He, the Holy Ghost of God, to preach what you've laid upon our heart. And God, when we preach, I pray someone will be different this morning. I pray you'd use it now. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. As we look at 1 Kings chapter number 18 and verse number 20, many of you know already the history of the nation of Israel at this time. They're in a low spiritual tide. They're in a place where they're serving the God Baal, the God of another world, the God of that world. But yet God has a man. Can I always say this? God always has a man. Amen. God chooses men to execute the the desire that he has to win people to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad that God had this man named Elijah. I'm glad Elijah had a little bit of God on him when he stood before Ahab, when he stood before Jezebel, and he was not afraid to say what God had put in his mouth. I'll never want to be afraid to say what God has put in my mouth and give me a burning message in my heart. Friend, can I tell you this morning, God didn't give me a sermon, God didn't give me a sermonette, but God burned a message into the recesses of my soul, down on the deep part 
on the inside. I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for a man that doesn't have a message burning on the inside of his heart. Say amen. I'm glad I can tell when a man like this man has a burning desire. And these men that I've seen in years gone by have burning desire to preach the Word of God without fail and with compassion and with teary eyes and knowing that if Jesus doesn't make the difference, they'll die and go to hell. But I dare say what's missing this morning is the fire of God on the churches of God. We've grown stale. We've grown stagnant. We've grown complacent and satisfied with all that God has given us. And yet in the nation of Israel in this moment, we find they're satisfied serving their lust. They're satisfied serving their flesh, serving the desires of their world. But yet God was on the scene. God was aware of their situation. God was aware of where they were as a nation. God was aware of where they were as a people. And can I say this morning, friend, God is very much aware of the state of His church. God is very much aware of the state of the flock of His people. And God desires this this morning and today and tonight and tomorrow to rekindle a fire in our souls that we would serve Him with a fervor and a desire to want to reach people the way that somebody reached us. The reason I'm standing here this morning is because that man was faithful to stand behind the old pulpit and preach the Word of God without fail and with compassion. And I'm here this morning because a God in heaven loved me and provided for me and made a way for me that I'd hear the blessed Word of God and He, the Holy Ghost, brought conviction on my unworthy dying soul that was headed toward hell. But yet one day Jesus came where I was. Yet one day the Holy Ghost took me by the hand and led me to the foot of the cross that I may meet the man called Christ Jesus. And immediately he changed my life and made me a new creature. Immediately my sins were washed away. Immediately, Can I say this morning it was immediate. There was no second baptism. There was no waiting on the filling of the Spirit of God. In that moment the Holy Ghost of God indwelt me and I became sealed and reserved for the day of redemption by the Lord Jesus Christ. I am what I am this morning because somebody in my life had some fire on them. You are what you are this morning because somebody had a little fire on their life. As we look at 1 Kings 18, verses 20 down to verses number 38, Elijah comes on the scene. Now, Elijah was not afraid to stand before the king. And can I dare say this morning, and I'll say it as nice as I can, but we've got a lot of preachers that are limp-wristed, noodle-back preachers that are afraid to say what God said. And I say that because I see it. I say that because I pastor in a city full of them. They're afraid to tell people what the Bible has to say. They're afraid they'll offend somebody. They're afraid they'll just turn somebody off. But can I say this? I would rather go to heaven this morning with a, a pure conscience and a right heart knowing I preach the Bible. Can I say to you this morning that hell is still a real place and that multitudes are still dying and going and the only thing that stands between them and that eternity are people like you and people like me. The only thing that stood between the nation of Israel this moment and the almighty wrath of God was the man Elijah. And God sent Elijah down to Ahab. And we know by study of this particular part of the Bible that there had been no rain for the space of three and a half years. The nation of Israel, the land was in a drought. They were in a, in a place that they needed God to do something to show off in their life. And Brother Crane, I dare say that we as a nation and we as a people were in such a drought and such a famine that we need God to show up and show off in our churches. Because if God does not do it, our methodology, our theology, and the things that we have clung to so long will fail and will not change men. But when we mount the pulpit with the power of God, when we sing with the power of God, when we testify with the power of God, people know the difference. They can see the real and the unreal. They can see the truth and they can see the lie. But let us mount the pulpit of God. Let us preach the Word of God with power and conviction. Let us do what God has called us to do with fire upon our life. The first thing I see this morning, there was a confrontation in verse number 21. The Bible said that Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow Him. But if Baal, follow Him. I see in this verse that Elijah brought a confrontation between God and the God little G, Baal. 
that there would have to be a decision made who the nation of Israel would serve. There would have to be a choice made if they were going to serve the true and the living God. If they would serve the God that brought their fathers across the Red Sea on dry ground. If they would serve the God that parted the river Jordan. If they would serve the God that brought down the walls of Jericho. Or would they serve the stone God that could not hear, that could not answer, that could not carry their burden. Or would they serve the God that delivered them from the mighty hand of Pharaoh. There has to be a choice in our life to have the power of God. There must be a choice and a sacrifice who will serve. We'll serve the true and the living God, Jehovah the great God. Or we'll serve the God of this world without power and in defeat. But tonight, this morning, I dare say, let us serve God Almighty. Let us serve the King of Heaven, the one who has brought us victory in our life and brought us safe thus far. There's confrontation. He said, how long are you going to be stuck between the two opinions you've got? See, the problem, friend, this morning is people like to be called Christian. They like the title of being God's children. They don't like the lifestyle required to be God's children. Preachers, you know that. You pastor these folks. I do too now. I see it. I, I, I didn't know what it was like to pastor. I thought everybody was nice and happy till you get behind the pulpit, preach to them three times a week, and you figure out they're not always happy. And then you figure out, or I'm learning real quick, that if you don't warn them, there's a train wreck in their life. And you can see it, but they can't ever see it. I'm going to tell you, I, two months, God has showed me a whole lot of stuff. A whole lot of stuff I didn't know. Some stuff now I wish I never knew. But what happens in our life is a lot of Christians in our day are in the place they like the title of being called God's children, but they don't like the service associated with being part of God's family. I, I say this this morning again as nice as I possibly can. I don't know how it is here, but where I live, we've got a whole lot of that new movement church. And I'll tell you this, that church is not a church for sinners. It's a church for backslidden Christians don't want to get right with God. That's all it is. Where we live, 97% of the young adults that attend contemporary churches after they're married and graduate college and raise their family never go back to those kinds of churches. They look for more fundamental, more traditional style of worship. And I'm afraid that our churches have lost such the fire of God that we have turned to the ways of the world to try to draw people in. We have tried to take the trinkets and the methodology of the world and of the devil and he has crept his way into the house of God much as Baal crept his way into the nation of Israel. And we have seen the churches become sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. We have seen the altars of God be torn down. I know it. I've preached in churches. Some of you men know it. You've seen it. But this morning the choice must be made whether we will serve God or whether we'll serve the God of this world. The choice, the two opinions. Many want to see God work, but many don't want to sacrifice to see God work. Brother, you mentioned it last night. Some things come up by prayer and fasting. We don't want to sacrifice in our life. We don't want to give up in our life in order to see the power of God. I tell you, the reason the revivals of yesterday were the way they were is because men and women sacrificed of themselves because they had a burning desire to see the power of God in their community. I'm all about revival. I'm all about jubilee. I'm more about a change that lasts beyond two or three days. I'm about a change that lasts for generation to generation. I preached many years ago in a church in Buffalo Junction, Virginia. You can't get there from here. You can't find it. But I preached in the pulpit behind my grandpa. And he'll tell you that was a church that was marked by a revival that went week after week after week. And as a young man stood in the pulpit, and you know what they told me, preacher? We still remember the revival, the revival that came all those years ago. And they were busting people into the church. And they were closing stores and things down so they could be part of the meeting. That's revival. That's when God sweeps in across the scene. How long has it been since we've seen meetings like that? Would it be because the fire of God has not fallen? We see that there must be a choice made. Elijah brings the confrontation in verse number 21. And then we see in verse number 22 that Elijah said, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Elijah said, I'm the only one left. 
Can I say that Elijah didn't realize that God still had a remnant of people in the nation of Israel that wanted to do right? And that there's still a remnant of people despite what our government does and what our country does and what society does? Can I say to you this morning that there's still a remnant of people that want to serve the Lord and walk with God and do what God has asked us to do? And these were the people that would help Elijah accomplish the mission that God had sent him on to Mount Carmel. My friend, this morning the confrontation must be made between our God and the God of this world. There must be a demonstration a demonstration of power between our God and the God of this world. Only one can be victorious. Only one can win a man's soul. Would it be our God or would it be their God? The second thing I see in verses number 23 through 35 is the challenge that Elijah issues to the prophets of Baal and the nation of Israel. Verse number 23, he said, Let them therefore give us two bullocks. Let them choose one bullet for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. I will dress the other bullock and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And ye call on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answereth by fire. Let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods. Notice this little G there. But put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them and they dressed it, called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and, and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is on a journey, or pre-adventure. He sleepeth and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after, the manner, uh, after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past that they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, and there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. In that small passage, we find that these men cut themselves to the blood around round about the altar as they gave their bodies in sacrifice to a God that could not hear them, a God that would not answer them, and a God that did not care about them. Elijah issued a great challenge to the nation of Israel. He said, what we're going to do is make it humanly unattainable. We're going to make it so that we cannot receive the glory and the demonstration for what will be done upon this mountain. Elijah said, you take the prophets of Baal, you take your bullock and you dress it, and you call on the name of your God. He said, and you do it from morning to the evening, from noon to night. He said, you do it all day long. He said, but at the time of the evening offering, at the time of the evening sacrifice, I will call upon the name of my God. And the Bible said that these men gave their body, gave their blood, but yet was to no avail. Yet the God of their world, the God of that world could not answer them. He could not help them because He was a God with no power. He was a God with no ability. He was a God with no authority in that world. Friend, this morning there are a lot of people serving the God of this world with no power and no ability and no authority, but yet you and I sit in church this morning and lift holy hands to the great God of heaven, the one that spoke the world into existence the one that flung the stars out from his fingertips, the one this morning put breath in our body and gave us the ability to get up and walk and dress ourselves, the one this morning that by the power of his word, everything consists and is held together. Can I say I'm not talking about any God this morning, but I'm talking about the God. I'm talking about the God that stooped over the portal of heaven and put his hands in the dust of the ground and formed and fashioned him a man after his own image and went so far as to stoop down and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. That's the God that I serve. That's God with power. And that's a God with ability this morning. And that is a God with authority. That the same God that could have wiped us out of existence was the same God that gave his body to be broken on Calvary's tree. Was the same God that let his own creation pierce his side and let his blood run down his body to the foot of Calvary's cross. That's the God of authority and ability this morning. Say, so how do you know, preacher? Because he got up on the third day because he conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he took the blood and ascended to the mercy seat of God. And there this morning he ever lives to make intercession for you and I. The blood is still upon the mercy seat. The blood is still fresh this morning. The reason we have power and authority is that it comes from God and from the blood upon the mercy seat of Almighty God. This morning the challenge was issued 
We see in verses number 30 that Elijah came near unto them and all the people came near unto him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Can I say this morning there needs to be some repairing of the altars of God in the house of God. I told our church, I said, I wouldn't get, they, the men talked to me about taking the altar away. and put, I said, don't take that away. Listen, friend, I won't give you a dime for a church that got an old-fashioned altar to crawl on. Oh, preacher, it's not needed in 2015. It's not needed in our day. But friend, can I dare tell you this morning that these altars are required in the house of God. It's here that we make our sacrifice. It's here that we call upon the name of God in such a manner that we cannot do it at home. I have a personal altar at home, and you should too. But it's not like the altar that's built in the house of God. It's not like what you have here. And men, what you have at your churches, and I know you understand that, but Elijah went and repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. The altar of God in this passage was upon top of Mount Carmel. It was in a place that all the nation could see. And yet it was torn apart. It was broken in disrepair. I'm glad the man of God had some gumption about him. Not to take and convert the altar of Baal. But to go back to God's place. To go back to God's position. And restore the things that have been broken down. And I'll tell you this morning what we need. Are some men, some young men that will go to the house of God. And restore the altar of God that's been broken down. Say preacher why would you take a church with 20 old people in it won't do nothing because there was an altar of God that was broken down that needed to be restored and God put upon my heart to restore the altar of God in High Point, North Carolina and what we need is some gumption about us to restore the altar of God that's been broken down in the house of God and not worry about the crowd and not worry about the people but worry about pleasing God Almighty this morning. Elijah went and repaired that and had been destroyed. I'm glad that Elijah didn't put Baal's altar in place of the Lord's. Amen. Because I would dare tell you this morning that Elijah had used the altar of Baal. God had never answered the man Elijah. I'm pretty sure my Bible tells me that God won't accept strange fire and strange sacrifice. But the Bible said in verse number 31 that Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar was great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. He said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar and filled the trench also with water. Can I tell you this morning that this in itself is a miraculous feat? I tell you that because the nation of Israel was in a drought that had been lasting three and a half years. There was not a fresh water supply. What water they had was precious. And people would tell us, I've had people tell me over the years, that they went down to the ocean, which was a two-day journey from where Mount Carmel was, and they brought ocean water up to the mountain. But friend, I dare tell you this morning that because there was a remnant of the nation of Israel that was left, when Elijah went to them and said, fill the barrels with water, they took their drinking water, they sacrificed. Do you hear me this morning? They sacrificed what was most precious to them to see God move in their midst and they took their drinking water they took the thing they had was precious it was in limited supply and brother Bell they poured that into the barrels of water and they took that and gave it to the man Elijah can you imagine this morning if you and I were in a trap for three and a half years had no rain, had seen no fresh water and the man of God got up this morning and put twelve barrels of water on the floor and said I want you to take every bit of water that you have, what you had to drink what you had to nourish yourself what you had to care for yourself and I want you to Put it into the barrel because I'm going to pour it onto the ground and I'm going to pour it on the pulpit and I'm going to pour it on the altar and I'm going to pour it in the choir law. And what we're going to do is give what we have most precious to see God work in our midst. I'm glad this morning that it wasn't seawater. I'm glad it was their drinking water. It was their most precious commodity of this time. And can you imagine being there that day, that evening as Elijah told him to take those barrels of water and pour it on the altar? Poured on the sacrifice. What Elijah was doing was taking their sacrifice and using it to demonstrate the power of the Most High God. That challenge was issued in verses number 23 through 35. And it, listen, friend, it was so, it, listen, it wasn't taking a bottle of Aquafina and pouring it on the offering and walking away. The Bible said there was so much water that it ran down in the trench and filled the trench up. I don't know exactly how big that trench is, but where I come from, a trench is a pretty big thing. I know, we dig them where I work. 
some of them, are, most of them I dig are big enough, or we dig, I don't I dig, I watch them do it on the heavy equipment. But I can get in it to about waist deep, Brother Bill, and that's a pretty big trench. You're talking about God filled a trench full of water that had run down off the sacrifice, off the wood, off the stones. You couldn't strike a match and light that altar if you wanted to. But yet Elijah had a purpose. We see number three, there was a call for power. Verse number 36 and verse number 37. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Before I read any farther, I want you to notice how Elijah worded the beginning of that prayer. Elijah put himself in as being the man that did exactly what God wanted him to do. Elijah began to some degree boast upon himself that he was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing and that he was the only one that had done those things and he was the only one left. Notice verse number 37. I find this greatly important. He said, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that Thou art the Lord God and that Thou hast turned their heart back again. Elijah called for power in verses number 36 and verses number 37. But Elijah began the prayer with him being the center point. Elijah began the prayer with him being the focal point of what was going on. But we find if that was what God would have honored, there wouldn't be verse number 37. But we find that Elijah went on and prayed. He said, God, it's you. God, you're the one that's going to do it. God, you're the one that's going to make the difference. You're the one that's going to bring the fire. You're the one that's going to bring the power. And we find that after verse number 37, after the I is removed and the V is replaced with it, we find that in verse number 37, the Bible said, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When Elijah got to the attitude of prayer that was right in the sight of God, can I tell you this morning our attitude of prayer must be right when we approach God to beg Him for fire to fall. If it's all about us and there'll be no fire, but if it's about God and God's desire and God's work, then we have the right attitude. And friend, it'll produce the right atmosphere of prayer. And when the right attitude and the right atmosphere is utilized, then God can use us in the anointed place of prayer to send fire down from heaven. You say, preacher, what in the world do you mean? Well, Elijah went, not at just any time of day, but Elijah went at the time of the evening sacrifice to offer the evening offering. That was a time set aside for the nation of Israel to worship God through sacrifice and through offering. And Elijah went at the appropriate time of prayer. He had the right attitude, which would produce the right atmosphere, but he went to the anointed place of prayer to call on God. Say, where was it? He went to the altar of God to call on the name of God. He didn't run down to the sandwich shop. He didn't run down to the church across the street, but Elijah found the altar of God where he knew that God would meet with him and he found the place where God would demonstrate his power and it was right there in the anointed place of prayer that God caused the fire of heaven to fall. Can I tell you this morning, our attitude must be right. If our attitude's right, it'll produce the right atmosphere of prayer. And if it's done in the anointed place of prayer, then you and I are recipients to receive what God would send us from top of heaven. It was said last night that we need an old-fashioned, Holy Ghost, heaven-sent revival. I dare ask us this morning, are we in the right attitude, atmosphere, and are we in the anointed place of prayer to receive that which we crave so much? Oh, preacher, if just one of those is out of the way, then I don't think we can receive heaven sent Holy Ghost revival. This morning, Elijah called for power. When Elijah got to where God could use him, God sent power down from heaven. And you say, preacher, why would God send fire from heaven to consume it? Because God was demonstrating to the nation of Israel that He was God and God alone. That He was sovereign among any other God. That He stood head and shoulders above the God of this world. That God Baal could not answer. But yet when Elijah called in this simple prayer of asking for power, God sent fire down from heaven. Can you imagine what it would have been like that evening to see the man of God on his face calling on God and in just a few moments the heavens opening 
went up and fire falling from the sky. And the Bible said that it consumed the offering. It consumed the sacrifice. It consumed the altar. It consumed the wood and the stones and licked up the water that was in the trench. Friend, that right there is amazing in itself. God left no evidence of the altar of God. The fire of God was so consuming. And it's that way in my life, in your life. When God's fire falls, it consumes everything about us. Friend, I'm telling you what, you ought to say amen this morning because it took the wood and it burnt the stones and it burnt the dust to the ground and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Baal couldn't do it. The God Dagon couldn't do it. But Jehovah God, the one that could provide, the one that provided the ram on the mountain was the God that sent fire down from heaven was the God that consumed the altar and the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones even to the dust of the ground. It left no place for Baal to ever build another altar on top of Mount Carmel. Verse number 38 is consuming proof of the power of God. It consumed all that was on top of the mountain. It consumed the evidence of another God. And then it consumed the hearts of the people. Verse number 39, And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. Something about fire falling from heaven. If we're serving other gods in our life, when God's fire falls, it consumes them. And in the process of consuming the other gods, it consumes our hearts as well. I dare say this morning there was such a change in the nation of Israel that they went out and slew all the prophets of Baal. And Israel turned their heart back to God. Can I say this morning what we need is fire to fall from heaven. Consume our hearts. Consume the gods of this world. Consume the house of God. And let God's people turn their heart back to Him.